This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Human Action Podcast. Today I'm going solo and I'm covering a topic that was a listener request amidst my trolling, which has a high social value on Twitter. Somebody said, yeah, hey Bob, maybe could you comment on like the tariff stuff people are talking about a lot lately since you know, you're know you an economist and all? And I thought, yes, I can do that. First though, let me just mention the Mises Institute on September 14th is gonna be holding an event in Albuquerque. So we invite you to join Peter Klein and Ryan McMakin in Albuquerque, New Mexico, for a Mises event on strategy, economics, and decentralization of power. The theme is living free in an unfree world, and they will discuss the potential for markets to displace the state. So again, it's going to be held on Saturday, September 14th. If you're interested, go to Mises.org slash NM24. That's for New Mexico. Again, Mises.org slash NM24 if you want to get tickets for the Mises Institute event in Albuquerque. Okay, so again, for today's topic, I thought it would be good to share some thoughts on how I, as an economist, would analyze. I'm not going to get into the particulars of specific legislation or you know, what Trump did in his administration, then Biden continued it, and now Trump is also proposing uh, higher tariffs and so on. Rather than getting into the weeds of the particulars of these things, just big picture, the idea of, hey, is it, what about slapping on tariffs if we use the revenue to reduce income taxes, right? That's kind of the thing. I know Orrin Cass, for example, that's one thing that his organization is touting. So they're saying, you know, this isn't a question of, are you for or against free trade? It's given that the government's going to tax something. We think, you know, maybe it makes more sense to tax imports rather than American labor, you know, that's that's a a very glib way you could try to sell this, all right? And, and Orrin has been saying things like that. All right, so that's what I'm going to just try to give you guys a framework for. So let me mention at the outset here, this is going to be, I think, not contradict anything in standard Austrian economics, but it's going to be more of a mainstream, just standard public finance analysis, just to give you some insight into this is the way professional economists kind of deal with these things when they're modeling or assessing one type of tax versus another. Okay. Uh, so I'm not here. You know what? Taxation is theft. I said it. Okay. So philosophically, morally, ethically, obviously I'm against taxation per se. Those of you who know my you know writings know that. But here again, I'm just trying to address the, the listener's question is to say, this is, you know, this is a hot button item now in some quarters on the right about, hey, we've always been taught as good libertarian or free market fans, if you're more of a conservative than a libertarian, uh, you don't want the government messing with business, you don't like taxes, but what about if we use the money, like I say, to reduce income taxes? Okay, so before I get into using the money that way, let me first just big picture, and I'll do this really quickly because it's pretty standard stuff, but why is it that there is a default presumption in favor of free trade, right? So even among Rothbardian libertarians who no longer support open borders, right? Where they say, oh, actually, you know, come to think of it. And I, my discussion, I'll link to it, of course, folks, with Dave Smith here on the Human Action Podcast, where he made that case to say, yeah, I used to be totally against any restriction on immigration, thinking that was just a natural outflow of libertarianism 101. And then he's, you know, reconsidered that now. Um, but even among that group, there's still... You know, they're very staunchly in favor of free trade as a first best alternative or or policy outcome, I should say. All right, so let's make a note here about the Dave Smith. So let me just very briefly explain why that is. So first and foremost, tariffs are taxes, and we can talk in a minute about who bears the burden. But in general, for people on the right, you know, coming from more populist uh, approach, trying to argue that, tariffs will in and of themselves promote the prosperity of the United States and that, you know, this country was built on high tariffs and you know, that kind of thing. That, that doesn't really hold up to scrutiny. All right. And again, what you're saying is the U.S. government enacting more taxes, that that's going to generate prosperity. And so just when you say it like that, that, that would be rather implausible. 
All right. Um, also, the standard case for free trade is a unilateral one, right? So the argument is not, oh, we should lower our tariff barriers because then if we can, you know, have a good deal with our trading partners or potential trading partners, then, you know, we can cut a deal where we lower our barriers to imports and then you guys symmetrically lower your barrier and then we're all better off, right? In, in general, there's a lot of situations in life and, you know, social living where that sort of pattern does play out, right? You could say, hey, I agree, I won't steal valuables from your house when you have me over for dinner, but in exchange, I kind of expect you to reciprocate and you don't steal stuff from me when you're over at my house for dinner, right? And then we're both better off than if we were worried about our dinner guests stealing stuff from us, right? You see how that works? And so, but it's, it's there, it's like you're giving a potential gain that you could have in the, in the moment, you know, it, it doesn't, it, it helps you. That's why you might steal something from your neighbor while you're over at his house. Is because that directly benefits you, but it hurts him. And the idea is, in a sense, it hurts him more than it helps you. And so that's why if you both agree not to do it, you're both better off, you know, that kind of deal. What I'm saying, though, is that's not the situation when it comes to free trade. The standard free market economist argument in favor of free trade is not one of reciprocity. It's not saying, oh, yeah, us lowering our tariffs in and of themselves makes, you know, hurts our workers and makes the U.S., poor that erodes our manufacturing base, you know, whatever kind of art you might make. But maybe then we can, you know, have bargaining power and get other countries to follow suit. That's not the case, right? They're saying, I don't care, fix whatever it is the other countries are doing. Now, other things equal, if the U.S. government lowers tariffs on Americans, you know, or on imports coming into the United States, that other things equal makes Americans as a whole have a higher standard of living or, you know, raises real income, however you want to phrase it. That's what the standard case is, just to make sure you understand that, all right? So it doesn't matter. And the reason I'm going into that is, first of all, just for pedagogical reasons, like I'm an economist trying to teach you folks, this is the way economists think about these issues. But also, if you get that point, then that diffuses the most immediate objection you'll get when you start making the case for free trade is somebody in you know, modern American political culture will say, oh, but you know, China's, open your eyes, China's not doing free trade, right? They're not, they're not respecting the rules of the game. And so what, you know, we're just suckers. And, and I'm saying it doesn't matter. So give you an example, worst case, you know, worst case scenario, suppose the Chinese government uses its taxation or co outright coercion, you know, enslaves people, makes them make a bunch of plasma screen TVs, whatever, electronic goods that you have in mind, and then just ships them over to Americans for free, right? They, they open up distribution centers in the United States, and they just have this, you just go in and just say, yeah, I want that TV, and they give it to you for free, okay? And so then, you know, isn't that a case, you know, wow, that's really undercutting, that's dumping, that's another verb they use in this context, goods on us, and come on, how could we be expected to compete with that when they're cheating so much and they're just subsidizing their export? And so doesn't that kind of hurt the United States? And, you know, when you've reached that point, that's when you need to stop and take a step back and just think through, no, it doesn't make Americans poorer if other people give us free stuff, right? If they send us over a thousand brand new TVs, that makes the people in the United States 1,000 TV sets richer. That's how that works. Okay. And, um, you know, you can say, I'm, I'm not going to dwell on this because there's a lot of other points I want to make, but I understand the, the immediate objection is, oh yeah, you're, you're just focusing on the consumption side. Of course, that's good for the consumers, but you're overlooking the fact, Murphy, that it hurts the workers. The, you know, the Americans who might have made TV sets now can't. And so they're out of work and it, Right. And so then they would go do something else. And so this insight, you know, that was the the essence of Frederick Bastiat's famous essay, The Petition of the Candlemakers. Right. So I'll link to that. If you've never read that, you absolutely have to. Like it's a it's a classic. Even if you people who don't care about economics, they should read that. Like it's just is is a work of I mean, literature might be a strong term, but it's 
in the history of human writing. Like that's a that's an interesting element of that set, a member of that set. So I will link to that. You should definitely read that. It's not it's not particularly long if you've never read it before. And so there, you know, he's it's it's satirical, and it's the candle makers in France are petitioning the French government to say we have all this this unfair foreign competition during the daytime people don't use candles in France because the sun is competing with us right people just open up their windows and let the sun in and why would you you don't need need to light a candle indoors or outdoors for that matter in that scenario and so what we want to do it will promote industry is if people are forced you know to shut shutter their you know put drapes over their windows or what have you during the day to not let the sunlight in. And so now think of how that will spur French industry, right? That the candle makers will have higher demand for their product. You know, the people making them will hire more workers. The workers will get more, you know, their wages, they'll go spend them on croissants and, you know, baguettes and what other stereotype you want to use. Um, and so see, it's great. So why don't we do that? Cause really it's kind of unfair how can you possibly compete with the sun if you're in the business of making things that produce light? Because the sun just dumps all of this light on us for free. How could you possibly compete with that? Right? So that's crazy if, if, you, if you say it in that format, right? That no, the French are richer because of the natural free sunlight. We don't have to devote scarce labor and other resources, you know, what goes into making the wax and the wick and so forth into making candles when we get the ultimate service, namely the, the light for free from nature. All right. So that it frees up those resources to do something else. So now we have the light plus whatever else it is that the labor and the other resources that would have to go into candle production were it not for the sunlight, you know, now those resources are freed up to make something else. So now the French per capita are richer or have a higher standard of living than they otherwise would have, right? So that's the, the way the argument works. So yes, it is true if China just starts sending over free TV sets, that would make it so Americans would not be able to stay in business producing domestically producing TVs. I mean, right now, I don't know, even if that's a thing anyway, like even <laughs> in the real world, it might be that that's no longer uh, cost-effective. But whatever the product is that right now, you know, U.S. workers making your word, what if some foreign countries from foreign government subsidize their exports of that? And I'm just saying, take it to the limit. They just give it to us every year for free. As much as Americans want of that product, that some foreign government just subsidizes, you know, taxes their own people in order to send Americans as much of that stuff as they want at a zero price year after year. And I'm saying that would not make Americans poor. That would make us richer. That would just be like if, if all of a sudden the farmland in the U.S. just got more productive and you know, more crops per acre shot up than before, that clearly makes us have a higher standard of living. It might hurt some farmers, right? So imagine if just half of the farmland, for whatever reason in the U.S., just be, be, you know, maybe some the, the bees or something around there just change their patterns, what have you. For whatever reason, half of the farmland in the U.S. all of a sudden became twice as productive per acre than before. But half of the, of the farmland didn't see that gain. That would hurt the owners of the farmland that didn't see the productivity boost, right? Because now the stuff that was shooting out of the ground that was more fertile now, the the unit price of that would end up being lower than it was before, right? Because now there's a higher output of that. So it's good for the, the owners of the land that's more productive that be, be, yes, the unit price drops, but now they have twice as many units, you know, for the same amount of inputs. So they're okay, even though the, the unit price of their product, you know, whatever is corn or wheat or whatever drops, tobacco, or what have you. But for the people that didn't see the, the physical land become more, productive, that wouldn't help them. They, they would be hurt, right? But clearly, Americans in general are better off if the land, you know, if their farmland now on average is more productive than before, right? So the same kind of 
you know, analysis. Okay. So that's the case. Again, notice there, nothing in that argument had to do with the reciprocal trade policies of the other governments. We're just saying, no, in and of itself, you want stuff coming in. And if, if foreigners can make something on better terms than your own resources would require, it makes sense to outsource the production of that. That's, that's one way of putting it. Okay. Let me just now just start going through, um, you know, what, so, so there I showed why you wouldn't want other things equal. You, a, a, a direct tax on imports doesn't make Americans richer per se by itself. But now there's a related question. Okay, what if the government needs revenue though? So it's got to tax something. And then the question is, okay, does it make more sense to tax imports or domestic income or, you know, this, that? Okay. So here, one important principle to understand is that when economists analyze the impact of a tax and like talk about the, like one type of tax approach versus another and which is better from like a, a social welfare perspective, or uh, you know, might call it economic efficiency, it's not a matter of the flows of money to the government, right? So it's not merely, it's not enough just to say, oh, well, if one, you know, tax regime A, once everybody adjusts to the new rules and everything gets into a new equilibrium, $2 trillion, trillion dollars a year flow from Americans, whether businesses or workers or consumers, into to, uh, you know, the coffers of the IRS, and some other tax structure, tax regime B, maybe only a billion or sorry, a trillion dollars a year flows to Washington. And so does that necessarily mean that tax regime B is more efficient because it's a lower tax burden? And that, oh, they're only taking half as much if I, if I said two trillion and one trillion, I think that's the numbers I said, right? And, and the answer is strictly speaking, no. That the way you impact or the way you assess the impact of a tax is not simply the do, looking at the total do, dollar amounts, right? And so the way to see it's just using an exaggerated example. If the government comes out and says, um, anybody who buys a, a car or let's say a new car is going to get on top of the, you know, the purchase price that you normally pay, you're going to also have to pay a $200,000 surtax per vehicle for anybody that wants to buy a new car. And they enforce that, you know, with a draconian hammer, Right, they really go through and they hire all sorts of agents and they have spies all over the place to try to look at black market deals and they really enforce that. Versus the government coming out and saying, any um, new car purchase, we're going to have this new surtax of $100 per vehicle that's going to be assessed and that, you know, that'll flow to Washington. So, you know, when the dust settles and everybody reacts to the new situation, probably the latter tax is going to result in more dollars on that new car surtax flowing to Washington. Because in the first regime where it was a $200,000 per vehicle surtax, just no one's buying new cars anymore, right? And so there's not going to be that many units times 200,000 to represent how much total money flows in tax receipts from this new tax to Washington, All right? But that wouldn't mean, oh, so therefore that tax regime A doesn't distort the economy very much and doesn't have a lot of, you know, economic costs that no, that would be devastating. That would ruin the, the vehicle market. And then people would have to be, you know, they would just keep driving their old vehicles into the ground. Then they'd be switching to bicycles and, or, you know, taking public transportation. Like that only thing that would make sense is like public transportation. Okay. That where they could afford to pay the $200,000 fee to get the vehicle in the first place and then just, you know, jam pack it with passengers and, you know, maybe that would be profitable, but nobody's, you know, it's going to be Klaus Schwab's uh, utopia. No, no one's owning any vehicle in a private setting and that's then that regime. And so there'd be, it would be terrible consequences to everybody. All right. So the, the actual, the, the metric that economists use is what's called deadweight loss. And so the idea is the, the reason, the fundamental reason a tax is bad in terms of standard economic analysis is that it prevents win-win transactions from occurring. That in the absence of the tax, there's a lot of voluntary trades that occur where both parties walk away better off than, from the, you know, than they were in the status quo. But if there's a tax, it like introduces a wedge in between the two parties or two potential parties, 
and you know, and depending on the numbers and the, the size of the tax, that renders some of those gains from trade not being seized, right? And so that's and that's referred to as deadweight loss. Okay, so that's another important thing to realize. Um, while I'm talking about that, let me just quickly mention there's a difference between um, who a tax is formally levied upon and who actually bears the burden of it. And so here, um, and it has to do with the elasticities of supply and demand. If, you, if I'm, I'm saying this in case you ever took like an economics class and you're vaguely remembering this stuff, that's what I'm talking about here. And so the idea is just to give you an example. Um, suppose it's something like cigarettes. And right now, whatever, the pack of cigarettes is selling for $5. And there's, there's, there's no taxes. Now the government comes in and says, oh, we're going to um, slap on a, a $1 per carton, or not carton, per pack tax. And uh, should we levy it on the, on the buyer or on the seller? And you know, you might say, oh, what's more fair and who can bear in standard economic analysis, it doesn't matter. Whichever party you formally levy the tax on, prices adjust such that whichever person um, is more their either supplier demand is more elastic is the one that can kind of evade the tax better. And the one whose either supplier demand is relatively inelastic is the one that, that bears the burden. Okay, so for this particular example, um, suppose they levy it on the buyer, right? So the consumer goes, and whatever the sticker price is, at the cash register, the store adds $1 to it, and the consumer out of his wallet has to hand over an extra dollar that the storekeeper then you know holds and then sends to the government, whatever, at the end of the month or something, keeping track of the cigarette sales. All right, so there you might think, oh, the $1 per pack tax is being borne by the consumer. Well, no, because if the elasticities were such that the producer should bear all of the burden, then in the new equilibrium, the sticker price of the cigarettes would fall to $4. And so then the consumer goes to the register, hands over the pack of cigarettes, the guy scans it, it's $4 up, oh, but there's tax, hits the button, and now you owe us $5. So from the consumer's point of view, before the tax was imposed, a pack of cigarettes cost him $5. Now, after the tax is imposed, a pack of cigarettes costs him $5 out of his pocket. All right. So even though he's formally paying the $1 tax, it's actually the, um, the comp, you know, the, the, the tobacco company or whoever that's actually only now getting in the new equilibrium $4 revenue per pack sold, whereas before they were getting five. So they actually are the ones bearing the brunt of that. Or, you know, it could be the other way around. Suppose the supply and demand are such that the burden of the tax is going to fall on the consumer. Well, then there, it doesn't matter which way you, you levy the tax. So even if you formally levy it on the producer, right? So now the model is someone goes, they hand the cigarette, the pack over, the guy scans it, it is the sticker price. That's what the consumer pays. And now out of that revenue, $1 gets subtracted in the, you know, the clerk or the store saves that and then sends it to the government and only remits the net amount to the seller. And so there, in a sense, the consumer is just paying the sticker price and the new tax is being 100% paid by the company, right? But again, it, that doesn't matter because what can happen if the, if the elasticities are such that, oh, in this, in this thought experiment now, um, it's the consumer that we assume is the one that's going to end up really, quote, paying for the tax in the economic sense, then what would happen in the new equilibrium, the sticker price of the cigarettes would end up rising to $6 a pack. All right, and so the consumer is now paying $6 for a pack of cigarettes, whereas before he was paying five, and the company is still netting $5 per pack of rev, you know, revenue per pack sold, even though formally the company, out of the money it's getting from the consumer, has to take a dollar off the top to send to Washington. Okay, so that's how this stuff works. And I'm just doing the two extreme cases there. In reality, you know, it might be some, somewhere in the middle where, uh, you know, oh, if they levy a dollar tax, the consumer ends up 
bearing 70%, you know, 70 cents of it and the, and the producer 30 cents. And the point is, just you're not getting mixed up, that notion of who's really bearing the burden of the tax is going to be true regardless of which party it's formally levied upon. It just, the, the price is adjust to, to make that outcome happen. And so now in the context of international trade and a tariff, a lot of times people get hung up on, well, who's it posed on? And so a lot of times a populist proponent of tariffs will say, hey, instead of taxing American workers for the income and the wages they get, why don't we tax these foreign companies trying to sell us stuff? Especially if they're using slave labor and doing all kinds of you know other stuff that we don't agree with, let's tax them instead of taxing our people. And then to counter that, often the you know American libertarian types will say, "No, you idiot! Don't you know that tariffs are taxes on Americans? Americans pay those." And a lot of times the arguments seem to be over the person or the party upon which the tax is formally levied. Or sometimes um, the domestic libertarian types realize that, oh, no, it has to do with, you know, prices are higher or something. So that's, you know, if, if the, if the, even if the foreign companies technically are the ones writing the checks to the IRS or to, you know, the tariff collection agency, what have you, still prices end up higher for American consumers. That, like, that's the whole point. That's what would cause American consumers to switch to domestic producers and buy American, right? If, if now the foreign products from the domestic consumer's point of view are less attractive, it must be because they're more expensive. And so the, the idea is how, do, you know, you're not helping American consumers by making stuff more expensive. That's the idea. So my point is a lot of times when you see those crude arguments, it's like all or nothing when in reality, it's, I think, you know, most goods and services that are, can be imported it would be somewhere in the middle. I don't mean like literally fit down, down the middle, but I'm just saying it would be one versus the other. <coughs> or rather, I should say, it would be partially borne by one party and, and the rest by the other. And so in general, you know, and, and, it, and it doesn't have to do with how the tax is formally levied. All right, so it's, if people are making blanket statements like, no, no, tariffs are ultimately paid for by U.S. consumers, that's not true. Or, but if, you know, a populist flips it and says, no, 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 tariffs are ultimately paid for the foreign companies trying to sell us stuff. Again, that's not, that's not really true. Or it's, at the very least, it's very misleading. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Okay. Um, as far as analyzing the impact of different tax regimes. Um, so here... Let me start with something that's pretty straightforward and non-controversial. Economists in general think that a consumption tax is more economically efficient than an income tax. And so this is why you might often see economists endorsing a sales tax, because that's, that's kind of like a, a tax on consumption. Okay. Is, um, There's some stuff in Rothbard's Man Economy and State that challenges some of the things I'm going to say here. And it would be, it's, I, I can't get into the weeds with that. Obviously, if people want to give me feedback, I can um, point you to some things. My study guide to Rothbard's Man Economy and State, I think in the portion where he's dealing with this stuff, I think gives some clues as to how to navigate. In other words, if you take a standard economics class at the undergraduate level, and you see the kind of things I'm talking about here, and then you go read Man, Economy, and State, it's going to look like there's a contradiction. And it's, I think it's more they're, they're speaking past each other. That's kind of what I'm trying to get across here. So the stuff Rothbard says in Man, Economy, and State on this tax incidence analysis, I largely agree with. But I think someone reading that would believe that, oh, so when mainstream economists do this tax analysis, they're just, they get it all wrong. And it, it's, it's more nuanced than that. That's what I'm trying to say. So obviously... I'm not here telling you things that I think are crazy. Just, you know, like, oh, and so some of these people in this tribe sacrificed their babies to the volcano god. And now here I'm saying some mainstream economists, that, that, that's not what I'm doing. <laughs> the reason I'm giving you this is because I think the intuition that this gives, at least insofar as it goes, is, is helpful and makes you understand economics better. Okay, so with all that caveating and housekeeping, 
why is it that mainstream economists tend to have a presumption, uh, a favoring of consumption taxes versus income taxes? Fundamentally, it's because, again, going back to that principle, what economists want to minimize is how much the tax system distorts behavior, right? That, you know, going back to that $200,000 per vehicle tax, the reason that's destructive is that before that tax, there were people who made, you know, took resources, including human labor and made vehicles. And then there were people who bought them. And those were win-win transactions and both parties benefited by slapping on that $200,000 per unit tax. It just made those trades not happen anymore. And so it didn't raise much revenue, but it was still very destructive because now, you know, those win-win transactions didn't occur. And so um, the idea is in a standard model, a consumption tax raises a desired target of revenue by dis distorting behavior less than an income tax that, you know, has to be calibrated to raise the same target amount of, of total revenue. And the, the, the intuition behind that, the reason is, um, an income tax besides simply, uh, not letting a person consume as much per, per dollar that they have available to spend, right? So if there's a 10% consumption tax and you've got a hundred dollars that you would normally be able to buy a hundred dollars worth of consumption, well now, oops, now you only end up with $90 worth of consumption, right? So that, that's clearly, you know, something's going on there. But the problem with an income tax is besides that direct effect, it also messes with the intertemporal trade-off. And so, and the reason is because interest and dividend income is typically included as part of uh, an income tax, right? And so if you have $1,000 right now that you were thinking about spending on consumption and there's a 10% consumption tax, up, you know, it distorts that. But if instead you want to invest the money and let's say the prevailing market rate of interest is 5%, and then, so you could either consume $1,000 worth of goods and services today or you could wait 12 months and then consume $1,050 worth of goods and services. And so if there's just a flat 10% consumption tax, then it's not affecting that intertemporal trade-off, right? It's just whenever you consume, 10% gets taken off the top and the government gets it, okay? But it's not affecting the fact that if you're willing to defer consumption for 12 months, you get 5% more. But that's not true if there's an income tax, because then instead of you getting, you know, 5% more next period, that growth rate is itself hit with the income tax. Okay. So, so it's distorting. So an income tax penalizes saving is, you know, that's one way that people like to, to express it. I think more, you know, more technically accurate is to say it's it's distorting the intertemporal trade-off. And so it's um, people who otherwise would have deferred consumption now in order to get more consumption down the road that's technically possible given you know our, our production technologies and resources and blah, blah, blah. Now they're not doing that simply because of this tax regime that's that's putting an extra penalty when you defer consumption because it's counting that as, as income and up oh, income per se now is being taxed if you have an income tax in place. Okay. So that's kind of the intuition for why economists, other things equal is a general rule. Say, if you got to raise a given amount of revenue, taxing consumption makes more sense than taxing income. And then I push this because there's a lot of economists like Scott Sumner who are then saying, oh yeah, see, so a flat consumption tax is, you know, optimal. It doesn't have any deadweight loss and things like that. And so I was pointing out that, well, no, if for the same principle, there's a problem with a consumption tax, whereas a, a flat head tax would be more efficient because even with a flat consumption tax, there's still the trade-off between labor and leisure. And so, and so you know, to say, oh, if I make $1,000, you know, if I have $1,000 to spend the, the consumption tax doesn't distort, you know, whether I spend it now or next year. And so blah, blah, blah. But where do I get the thousand dollars from? If I get it from working for a wage, um, the fact that that is going to be 
you know, that, that, that if I spend it on a thousand dollars worth of goods and services, you know, today, I'm really only getting $900 because the government's taking 10%. So that means the, the labor, you know, in a, in a no tax environment, the, the original status quo, I would have been willing to trade my labor hours in order to get a thousand dollars in pay. And then I would have bought it, spent it on goods and services. So I'm willing to do that. But now if the government puts a 10% consumption tax in place, then that means I got to do for that same amount of work that I need to do, you know, same amount of labor hours I need to sell in order to get the thousand dollar pay. Now I'm only getting $900 worth of goods and services myself. And so now that trade-off is distorted. I'm not willing to work as many hours as I was before. I end up consuming more leisure. So analytically, the reason that happens is because the government, you don't have to pay for leisure. Right. And so there's a sense in which when the government levies a tax on consumption, your consumption of your own leisure is not included in that. And so that's kind of one way to, to see like, oh, yeah, so that's that's why this the consumption tax, even if it's a flat tax and that, that, that and, you, and then, you know, a lot of economists talk about, oh, see, this, this is very good. It minimizes dead weight law. There's still that distortion. And so the idea is given, you know, let me put it to you this way. Suppose the government enacts the flat consumption tax that the economist recommends that would raise the desired target amount of revenue and everybody's happy. Now look at every year, how much each person in that regime pays in taxes. It would be more efficient to change to a new regime where now each of those people, instead of, you know, going, working, getting the income and then paying, you know, buying the goods and services they want to. And then the government gets 10% of that. Just that dollar flow. Now the government just says, let's, so let's say there's a person, they earn $100,000 a year and they just consume it all. Just to keep the, keep the numbers easy. So they only end up getting $90,000 of consumption and 10,000 goes to the government. I'm saying it would be more efficient if the, instead of doing it that way, the government just said to that person, regardless of what you do, the decisions you make, you owe us $10,000 a year in tax. And, you know, if we don't get it, we're throwing you in jail. So I don't, we don't care how much money you make. We don't care what you spend on a consumption. And we're just saying you owe us $10,000 a year, period. And I'm saying that would be more efficient if we, you know, other things equal than the, than the consumption tax. Because now that person might choose to work more because on the margin, if they work and bring in an extra $1,000, they get an extra $1,000 worth of goods and services. It's not that they're only getting 900 Right. And so the, the, the flat head tax or poll tax is not distorting the labor leisure trade off. Okay. So I'm, I'm kind of going through this stuff just to, to warm you up and get you understand the way to think about these things. So now um, that I've given you that, this leads to another general principle with these things is that in general, in the public finance literature, economists think that. Again, other things equal. To raise a given amount of revenue, the way to distort things as little as possible is to have as wide a possible base so that the rate applied to that can be as low as possible. Right. So if you need to raise a trillion dollars of revenue, it's better to tax as much stuff as possible in the same, you know, like if it's consumption or whatever, with as low a rate that, you know, once you model and look ahead as to what will economic activity be in the presence of that tax, then we want it to be such that the base multiplied by the rate gives the desired revenue. Um, that is more, generally speaking, more efficient than if you only taxed half of the base at double the rate. Because in practice, given that, that those activities that are being taxed you know, have twice the rate applied, people will move out of them. So you actually won't, that won't be revenue neutral. That's one way of putting it. If you shrink the basis in half by only taxing half those activities, you know, you know, so like, let's say you had a flat consumption tax of 10%, but it was only applied to goods that, you know, the, their name started with A through M in the alphabet. Then, you know, also we tax apples and bananas and this, but xylophones don't get taxed. And then we just doubled the, you know, or we increased the, the tax rate proportionally. That wouldn't raise the same amount of revenue because people would get out of those apples and bananas more if the rate's higher and they would shift into xylophones and zebras and whatnot, 
All right. Obviously, I'm being a bit tongue in cheek, but you get the idea, I hope. All right. So that's, that's, keep that principle in mind. Okay. So having said all that, now when it comes to in general, it, would it be a good idea to impose, raise tariffs, but then with the new revenue that comes in to reduce income taxes dollar for dollar? There's two different forces at work. On the one hand, a tariff is more like a consumption tax than an income tax, right? So that would be a point in its favor. On the other hand, for a country like the United States, um, imports are only a, a, you know, a, a small fraction of total goods and services sold. And so it wouldn't really be a widespread consumption tax. It would be a consumption tax on goods imported from foreign producers, All right? So for something like a place like Hong Kong, there, yeah, it would totally make sense that, you know, other things equal if they had a consumption tax as opposed to an income tax because they have such a huge flow of imports that, you know, that, that would, most of the stuff, like a, an, in, an import tariff would be closer to just a general consumption tax than it would be for the United States. Okay. So that's part of the issue in terms of the, like to think through the logic of it. Um, let's see. Da, da, da. Let me just make one other point here and I'll wrap it up. No, two points. Okay. One is there's a very subtle technical point that I'm just going to mention and then point you to further reading if you, if you care. It's called the tax interaction effect. And so um, I really got into this in the, in the climate change debate. So a lot of the proponents for a carbon tax were saying, oh, we know that it's destructive to the environment to emit carbon dioxide. And so instead of the government taxing goods like work and saving and investment, stuff like that, you know, with the income tax and corporate income tax, stuff like that. Let's have them tax bads, right? So the slogan would be tax bads, not goods. And so the idea was let's put in place a carbon tax. And, and people on the right, like Arthur Laffer, really got into this because they were saying, look, at, let's stop fighting the left and saying, you know, they're exaggerating the danger of climate. Let's just stipulate that for the sake of argument and say, okay, yeah, you want, you want to have a $50 per ton carbon tax? Okay, let's do that. But since you guys are claiming this isn't a revenue grab, you're just doing it to save our grandkids from burning up, then you need to agree that every dollar raised from this new carbon tax will be used to offset payroll taxes or, you know, income taxes, whatever. So I, I liked it. I appreciate that, like, as a way to call their bluff and to see them, you know, come up with all the reasons. Well, no, 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 I can't, can't do that. Even though they're saying, you know, humanity is at stake here. Um, but the, there was something off in the logic or something missing in the logic. And it has to do with this thing called the tax interaction effect. And so I'll just say it and then move on because again, it's, it's a technical thing. I've got a whole article that, um, if you, in the show notes page, you can look, look at it if you want to see more. The idea is even if it made sense for environmental reasons, if you believe in negative externalities and all that stuff to impose, if let's say a $50 per ton carbon tax. And even if you used the revenue to offset the income tax, what could end up happening is the income tax on its own is distortionary. And then if you add on top of that a carbon tax, even if in the model you're using the carbon tax made sense in, ter in terms of Pagovian taxes because there's a negative externality and you want to align incentives, blah, 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 right? Still, the, the distortionary effect of the income tax gets enhanced when it's levied in conjunction with a carbon tax, even though the carbon tax in and of itself in this model makes economic sense. And that it can be such that even if you're using the revenue from the carbon tax to offset, you know, to, to lower the percentage rate on the income tax, because now you need it to raise less revenue, it can still be the case that it ends up exacerbating the damage from the income tax so much that you don't want to levy the carbon tax at the rate that would just reflect the, the negative externality because of climate change, right? So if, even if the textbook amount you, you quote should yield levy is a $50 per ton carbon tax because of the pre-existing income tax, maybe you only want to levy a carbon tax of 
$20 per ton. All right, so that's very counterintuitive. And I encourage you to, to read my article if you, if you like this kind of stuff that a lot of mainstream economists even were saying the thing backwards. It, it was, I mean, I can't get into it now because of the clock, but it was hilarious. Like there were pro-carbon tax people who were um, citing academic papers saying, see, this is why it, 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 there's extra reasons to levy a carbon tax, even if you're unsure about the social cost of carbon and blah, 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 because we're going to use it to offset this harmful income tax. And the papers they were pointing to and citing, I went and read them, and it was the, it was the exact opposite. But again, it was a very nuanced, like, I, I'm not accusing them of lying. I think they just didn't understand that, no, it actually goes the other way around. So that's called the tax interaction effect. It's because the carbon tax interacts with the income tax. So I'm saying something similar could be the case here where even if you know you isolated the effects of a tariff in isolation and the effects of the income tax, and even if you thought, oh, the tariff is less distortionary than the income tax for various reasons, or you know maybe you're, you're throwing in national security or other kind of considerations. So you think, in general, I would rather raise $100 billion in revenue with a tariff than with an income tax. You might think, therefore, it automatically follows that raising an extra $100 billion from tariffs and reducing income taxes dollar for dollar is obviously a win, and I'm saying not necessarily. That, it, that there's something else going on that you got to check your intuition. All right, so there's that. Okay, last thing I'll say. Somebody sent me this tax foundation analysis of the uh, Trump-Biden tariffs that came out in June of 2024. And they, at the tax foundation, they've got a, a, a general equilibrium model, they say. And I don't, I mean, maybe it's written up somewhere else to, to get more of like, the assumptions that go into this model and how it works. But let me just mention one thing that to me jumps out is something screwy with this, with these models. And it comes up with, you know, we estimate the Trump Biden tariffs will reduce long run GDP by 0.2%, the capital stock by 0.1% and employment by 142,000 full-time equivalent jobs. Da, da, da. And it's got a bunch of bullet points like that. And I'm saying that kind of stuff to, to me doesn't really make sense. That's not very accurate, Right. In the long run, tariffs do not affect employment, M meaning the, the, the number of full-time jobs. Okay, so it's not that, oh, if, if the government levies a really big tariff and then we check in 10 years after it's been levied, that the unemployment rate's going to be 8% when it otherwise would have been 4%. That's not how it works. Okay, because wages adjust so that everybody who wants to work can get a job. Okay, the, the harm of the tariff comes from making workers, their, their real wages are lower than they otherwise would have been. All right, but it's not that you can't get a job now. It's just the job you get is going to pay you less compared to the cost of goods and services, right? So the purchasing power of your paycheck is going to be less, other things equal with a, you know, a, a big tariff than if there's no tariff, all right? But it, it's not that you're, you can't get a job. That's not the issue, all right? And so with these models, and I would see this happen in the climate change stuff all the time. They would say, "Oh, this you know this new uh, subsidy for for green uh, adjustments. So the houses are going to build solar panels, and companies are going to get more insulation, and blah blah blah. And we think this will this will boost employment in the long run by this many jobs. And and is eh, no what what's happening is they're looking very narrowly, like at a in a, in a multiplier model where there's a sectoral flow and if more money's spent here and then this it happens and it and they kind of and there's no feedback effects and i was kind of showing like with one of these models the way it worked it was saying oh if the government spends this many billion dollars subsidizing wind turbines we can expect you know this increase in employment and i said there's nothing in the model we could just bump the number up by a factor of 100 and obviously it's not that the us would then have 400 million people working in the wind turbine industry or knock on effects from, you know, what, what they spend their money on the restaurants, right? That the multipliers they were showing, there was nothing in the model that if you just bump the numbers up, it wouldn't scale. And see, but clearly it can't be that the, you know, that this program creates 400 million jobs in the United States because there's not 400 million workers. Right. So I'm just, you know, I'm exaggerating though, to make the point, I'm saying the same thing here in general, if we're talking about in the long run, tariffs have zero effect on jobs. They don't create jobs. They don't destroy jobs on net. All they do is change the, you know, the real wages that you're earning in those jobs. 
Okay, so, oh, one last thing, not an economic consideration, but I think a huge point in favor of tariffs as opposed to the income tax is that uh, is the privacy element, right? It's, it's much, the, the income tax, it's not just the economic burden, but the fact that now the government gets to look at all your, all your stuff as a household and all, the th- all of your economic activity ostensibly to, to know how much you owe in income tax, but also to keep track of all that stuff. So in terms of, you know, big brother and them monitoring you and, you know, survey or yeah, surveilling you and curtailing your, your liberties in income tax is far more Orwellian than just at the port, you know, charging a, a fee on any, any goods coming into the country that way. Right. So there, there's that element, which you, know, you can't quantify. And that's not in the stuff I've talked about, but that's, but, but there for that, on the margin to be the decisive difference, it would have to be that, oh, we get so much revenue now from tariffs, we get rid of the personal income tax, right? It's not just if you change the rates on the tax schedule that now all of a sudden the government's not in your business, right? If Even if the income tax is just 1%, they still, you know, if you got to do all the returns and everything and list all your income, they still have you, right? So just keep that in mind too. Okay, well, that's a good spot to wrap up. Thanks for your attention and I'll see you next time check back next week for a new episode of the human action podcast in the meantime you can find more content like this on mises.org